We're going to be in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. It's good to see some of you we haven't seen for a little while. We know it's been busy out there with hunting and moving and everything else under the sun, and so it's always good to see God's people be back with his family. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. What we're going to look at is ordinary Christianity. This passage, we just looked at the transfiguration. Jesus up on the mount. His body is literally transfigured into a, a sliver of his glory, of what you would see in heaven, the Shekinah glory of God that, that Isaiah saw a glimmer of in the temple and Moses saw a glimmer of up on Mount Sinai and Elijah. And so you have this mountaintop experience that all of us long for, right? We all want to be close to God. And Peter, James, and John got to see that. They got to experience that with Elijah in the flesh. And Moses, they were there. They were there among them with Jesus, and they got to see it in this high experience. And then they come off the mountain and down into the valley, and we often experience that. So this is what it says in verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law were arguing with them. Them is the disciples. So Peter, James, and John, and Jesus come down off the mountain. And when they do... They see the disciples arguing with the teachers of the law. Verse 15, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, Jesus asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit but they could not. Now, if you remember Mark chapter 6, that was different. Jesus sent them out two by two, and it says that they had power to heal. They anointed people with oil and healed, and they drove out demons in Jesus' name, and we'll see a little difference there. You unbelieving generation, verse 19, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Verse 20, so they brought him, and when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth, and Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, the father answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. That's the core verse of this this chapter. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked and he convulsed violently and he came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and the boy stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him in privately, why could we not drive it, the demon, out? In verse 29, Jesus replied, this kind can come only through prayer. In the passage before us, it's, it's one that's easily skipped over. It has parallel passages in Matthew and in Luke, the synoptic gospels. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I think this is a picture of ordinary Christianity, that things that you and I can touch into, and I don't mean like putting our hands on and driving out demons. That's, what I don't, that's not what I'm talking about. Even though Jesus' power can do that today, just like it did then. What I mean is, ordinary Christianity, we see embodied by the disciples and their failures. When I was thinking about this passage, I was thinking about a movie that I really enjoy, and I've spoke about it before, Indiana Jones. You know, there's four of those, Indiana Jones. Believe it or not, Harrison Ford at 73 has signed on the dotted line to make a fifth one. Can you believe that? Dude's going to be geriatric like in a, I don't know. He's going to be doing, I don't know what he's going to be doing, but it's going to be crazy, okay? He'll be like in his 80s swinging from the rooftops and stuff. But in the third one, Indiana Jones in the, in the Last Crusade, the closing scene, which I've used with the youth to teach him principles, They have to go through this series of mazes to get through and to get to where the Holy Grail is, supposedly the cup of Christ. It's all fictitious. It's it's a fun story, but not true. And so these guys are trying to go through, and they die in the process. They fail left and right. Indiana Jones, of course, comes up, and he's reading out of his father's book, 
where he's kept meticulous notes for 40-something years on the Holy Grail and all that he's learned on it. And he says, the penitent man will pass. The penitent man will pass. The the penitent man kneels before God, and just as he hits his knees, the blade comes where his head would have been, right? And he passes through. He says, I'm through the first test. And his father, laying there shot, says, oh, but there's more. And they go on, and he goes to the next one. The the man of God will follow in the footsteps of of God, and so he, he spells it out in Latin. So he jumps on the first stone, and he falls through, but grabs on. Cliffhanger. And he says, oh, but in the Greek, it starts with whatever, and he follows the footsteps. I'm through the second test, and he gets to the third one. And he walks out on this big bridge, and it just drops forever, this big abyss. There's this lion's head there. And he says, Dad's notes say, only a leap from the lion's head shall a man prove his worth. Well, there's nothing there. Indiana Jones, if you follow the movies, is not really a believer, a Christian or anything. He just doesn't really believe in the cult. He's just this archaeologist, but he kind of puts his hand over his heart, and, and he steps, and boom, he lands on something, and he walks across this invisible bridge over to where the grail is, and when he gets into where all these cups are, the knight that is there protecting the cups says, choose among these cups, but choose wisely. Because the man who chooses the cup of Christ will drink from it to eternal life. Like I said, this is a made-up story. It's just fun. But those who choose unwise shall die. Well, the guys that go in with the bad guys, of course, they choose the golden nice cup, right? What Jesus would have, this cup that's gorgeous and gold and filled with all these stones and all these gems. Now, is that the cup of a poor carpenter? No. <laughs> So they drink from it, and of course they die. It's their end. But Indiana Jones, thinking, what's a poor carpenter like, finds this nasty cup carved out of wood, uses it in drinks, and of course everything's fine. He's the hero, right? I think that that passage kind of embodies how we sometimes, just like those people are on this path to follow God, they're following the footsteps of God, they're doing what the instructions say, we're doing what religion tells us to do, and we still fail all the time the disciples embody that here that no matter what they try to do in their own flesh they fail and they fail miserably and Jesus is going to teach them that it is through faith okay it is through faith that is the issue and not just faith but the object of faith him that we do great things and only through that right Ultimately, we're going to see that failure may make us bitter or it may make us better. As disciples, we are just ordinary people and we fall down on our faces all the time. And we get to choose bitterness or betterment. We get to choose to learn and grow or to go down a dark path away from Christ. We need to let our failures drive us to our knees. Our weakness should drive us to Christ's strength. Our weakness should drive us to his power. Our limitations should drive us to his unlimited resources, and it should make us humble, which should drive us to Christ's complete and almighty self-sufficiency in himself. We should always be looking to Christ because at the end of the day, what Paul writes in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who what? Who strengthens me, right? Paul learned that lesson as a disciple. You and I need to learn that lesson as disciples too. In our walk with Christ, we need to learn that everything centers around Jesus Christ. Jesus put it in a different place. In John chapter 15, in verse 4 or 5, he says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to be tied in to Jesus Christ or else we can go nowhere. Now in the parallel passages of Matthew 17, verses 14 through 20, and Luke 9, verses 37 through 43, they include this story, but it's, what I like about it is it's less detail. Now Matthew's got one very important piece that when you go to your small groups, you'll study in greater detail. But what I like is the vividness and the detail that Mark puts into this account. Now if you're going to write up a religion in a fake book, Would you write up your own failures? The disciples look like scapegoats here. They look horrible. You know, Jesus is saying, how long do I have to put up with you? He's talking to his disciples. Man, you guys, have you not been with me all this time and you still can't get it together? You know? And so if they were making something up, they wouldn't come out looking foolish like they do. 
But because it's the truth, the eyewitness, firsthand testimony of Peter, we can rely upon the trustworthiness of our Gospels. So there's three things I want you to see in here, okay? Verses 14 through 19. First of all, we never advance beyond our need for Jesus. Write that down. We never advance beyond our need for Jesus. In Mark chapter 6, the disciples went out. Don't take food. Don't take an extra cloak. Don't take a sword. Don't take money. Just go and go in the way of God and go into a town. And when you visit a town, look for a person of peace. And if they're a person of peace, they'll invite you in. They'll love on you. Share the gospel. People will come to Christ. And if they don't, wipe the dust off your feet and go on your business. And it says in Mark chapter 6 that they went forward, and when they did, they healed the sick, and they drove out demons. But now, just a few verses later, a few chapters later, these guys are miserable failures. They're blowing the play, right? The mountaintop experience has been wonderful, and they feel like they're on this great, powerful high, and they're the men, you know, and they think we can handle this, and we've done this before. Jesus has given us his authority, so we got this down. And what they were thinking about was technique. What was not unusual at that time was to use incantations, certain word mixes, and certain things said a certain way, and to do particular techniques. And you can just see the disciples trying to do this thing that, hey, last time it worked this way, so if we just repeat it this way, we do this technique, we say this saying, we do this, we just believe a certain way, and boom, it'll be done. Whose strength is that in? Their strength, not in Jesus Christ. And so they fail, and they come to him, and they say, how come we couldn't do this? And Jesus said, this can only come through prayer. But I think sometimes the mountaintop experiences are so wonderful and so great, and we all need those to kind of fill our tank, that they leave us too high and too lofty to engage in the day-to-day grime and grinding it out of our faith on this plane, on this earth. And I think the disciples were experiencing that. They felt that, right? As agents of his redemptive love, and they go in his name, the promise of his presence, they forget the difficulties of this world and how they have to rely upon Jesus and his power, not their own. In verses 14 through 16, when they came to the other disciples, a large crowd was around them, the teachers of the law argued with them, right? The teachers of the law are arguing with them. And as soon as the people saw Jesus, they rushed to him. And we find out later on in the passage that, in fact, they had tried to drive out this demon from the boy, and they had failed. So what do you think the Pharisees and the scribes, now that we've studied the book of Mark for half of it, what do you think they were doing to the disciples? Told you so. <laughs> Here's a finger in the eye, dude. I told you Jesus isn't all that. You guys think you're hot stuff? You're wrong. I got your number. You guys blew it. You stink. We see it, and we're going to make a big deal out of it. And so they are wandering around. They're arguing. These teachers of the law are arguing with the disciples. And the disciples have failed, right? And so they have all this criticism, these detractors. And they're in the middle of all this pain, and they're kind of giving it to the disciples for their failure to heal the boy and to drive the demon out. Because after all, ultimately the messenger represents the man that they represent, right, which is Jesus. And so they're kind of giving it to him. But ultimately, what they're trying to learn is that God wants them to learn you can't do things in your own power. You must come back to Jesus Christ. And is that not true for you and I today? I am no different than Peter, except for worse. I am no different from John and James, except for worse, or any of the disciples. I often think, hey, I got this down. I've studied. I've gone to seminary. I've done years of ministry. I've done all this, that, and the other. I got this, God. And the Lord often will humble me. And I bet you guys experience the same thing. That sometimes we move out in our own flesh. And God has to to humble us. What I think is interesting is verse 15. As soon as the crowd, the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to him. We as his disciples should have the same experience. That when we run into the difficulties of this life. We're never too big for Jesus, right? Growing up, whenever I would try to do something that I thought I was pretty good at or hot stuff, and I would fail, my grandmother would say, you're too big for your britches, boy. You ever heard that? (laughs) Boy, you're too big for your britches. You may be six foot two and this, that, and the other, but boy, that guy leveled you. You got humbled. Too big for your britches. And sometimes God has to allow us to fail so that we understand 
that we're too big for our britches. That it drives us to our knees and it seeks his face. God has to allow some failure. He doesn't want that. But he has to allow some failure. And he has to allow some criticism into our lives and detractors to point out our flaws so that we will seek his face and not just his hand. We are never too big for Jesus. We never advance beyond our need for Jesus. We never advance beyond our need for Jesus, not only with criticism, but also with the demonic, right? Look at verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. What the synoptic gospels, the other two parallel passages in Matthew and Luke teach you is this. It's even worse than that. Can you imagine if your son or your grandson was this bad? Well, guess what the other synoptics tell us? It was his only kid. So your only child has been oppressed by a demon that results in something that looks almost like epilepsy today, but worse. That it throws him into the water and into fire to try to kill him and destroy him. This man was desperate. And when we confront the demonic, we must seek the face of Christ. It says in Matthew 17, 15, that the man didn't just call him teacher, he called him Lord. You are teacher and Lord. And so he, he informs us that, that he respects Jesus. But we also know that he's not perfect because later on he says, if you can, Lord, heal him. So his faith was not perfect, but we'll learn from that in a minute. It says it seized him. It throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth. He becomes rigid, and it tries to kill him, and likely he had it since childhood. There's a lot of lessons that we're able to learn from this, but I want us to think about it a little bit. We're never too big for Jesus in dealing with the evil and demonic. There's some things that we need to take away from here. Number one, demons are real. They're not mythological. Demons and Satan are real. We don't need to talk about them too much or give them too much power, but they exist. They existed for Jesus. They exist today. One thing C.S. Lewis said is either we say too much power is given to them or we say they don't exist at all. Both are unbiblical. Demons are real and they exist. They're not mythological. Jesus clearly believed in the demoniac, right? The demonic. Demons desire, it shows us, to inflict pain and ultimately death. They do not wish anything good for you. I had a discussion with someone the other day, a few weeks back, and we were talking about something. And this individual said before their spouse that, I said, you got to be careful with these things and the other. It just kind of worked in the conversation. And the spouse said, oh, yeah, they like that. And I didn't say anything. You know, I don't want to be the judgmental pastor. I'm not going to jump on him. But then he went into this discussion of how he likes Ouija boards and this, that, and the other. And, yeah, it's just kind of fun, and, and it's just kind of great, and I just kind of enjoy myself. And I said, be careful. If you open the door for the evil, it's going to come running through. And no matter who you are, no matter what you have, you are not prepared for it. Without Jesus Christ, you are a helpless victim like this boy. So we got to be careful. Demons are capable of inflicting suffering. And sometimes they manifest themselves physically in people, meaning that they kind of oppress them and take them over. And in our own strength, we are helpless against the supernatural powers of the demonic. But spiritual victories are found in who? In Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that we have to sit around and we have to call them by name and cast them out or territorial spirits. I'm not talking about any of that nonsense. What I'm talking about is sometimes we run into the demonic and we need to quickly do what Ephesians chapter 6 says in verses 18 on. Stand firm in the Lord. In the Lord. Our relationship with Jesus better be good when we run into that because we're not up to the task. We better have on the full armor of God of his character qualities of love and mercy and grace and kindness. And we better be close to him in prayer like he's talking about here. Or else we're not going to be ready for that. And if you think these things don't exist, I've seen them firsthand. Not in the United States as much, but in foreign countries. One time when we were preaching in Brazil, in Terracina, one of the outlying favelas. That's a northern province in, in Brazil. 
We were preaching all these nights, and, and this man kept coming in, and he looked just ominous. He looked foreboding. He looked wicked and evil, and you could just see it written all over his body. He was a big, huge, strong man that was known to be a boxer when he was younger, a world-class boxer. And we thought, great, he's coming, and he'll hear the gospel, and he'll be brought to Jesus Christ. Until Thursday night, he came in with a double-headed axe with blood still on it. I don't know what the blood was, but I can tell you since I was preaching, it got my attention. Luckily, a couple of guys came and sat with him. A couple of other guys went and got a police officer, which was about an hour and a half away. That's how Brazil was. They kind of ushered him out. Later on, we found that he murdered two people a week later in that same favela. The demonic can be real, and it can be present. And we never advance beyond our need for Jesus Christ to deal with the supernatural. All other human efforts and hopes will run their course, and they will be exhausted. But we must turn to Jesus Christ. And the disciples did not get that. We need to turn to Jesus when we're defeated, right? The disciples, we couldn't do this. And what does Jesus say? He says that we are a faithless generation, right? Oh, you, unbelieving generation, faithless generation, Jesus says in verse 19, how long do I have to stay with you? How long do I have to put up with you? We do not want to be labeled along with the disciples in this area. We must be people of faith. We must be people of belief because all that we're trying to do for the kingdom of God depends upon it. We cannot move out in our own strength, in our own ability. We will fall flat on our face. Ultimately, we don't want to be like the disciples. How long am I to be with you? How long do I have to bear with you? Can you imagine Jesus showing up in your bedroom tonight and saying, Golly, bump, Greg. <laughs> Dude, how long do I have to put up with you? You are sorry, preacher. That's true, by the way. No, just kidding. <laughs> how long do I have to bear with you, Right? We don't want that. And Jesus wasn't being hard. Jesus was being honest. He was trying to point them back to, you got to believe. you got to have faith. you got to seek me out. You can't go off on your own. Soldiers that get separated from their units are called what? Dead. It's true for the believer. We must believe and stay with each other and with Jesus Christ, okay? I'm, I'm kind of convicted by the words of William Lane. He's a commentator. He says this in verse, uh, uh, sorry, page 332 of his commentary on the book of Mark. He says the rhetorical questions kind of express the loneliness and the anguish of Jesus Christ in a world where people do not believe. I think there's a lot of truth to that. When you share the gospel with people, do they automatically, yeah, let's do that. Let's give my life to Christ. It's not always that easy. Sometimes it is. But we live in a world with a lot of unbelief. And we need to never get too big for Jesus. We can never advance beyond our need for Jesus. And so we need to learn this valuable lesson about ordinary Christianity that we naturally have a propensity to try to do it without Jesus Christ in our own strength. And we don't want to be like the disciples and fall on our face. Let's keep it before us. Second of all, we never advance beyond our need for faith, right? Verses 19. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. In other words, I've taught you what you need to do. You should be able to do this. You should be running now and not just merely walking or crawling. But i got to do it for you, so bring him here, right? And then he goes on to say, so they brought him. And when the Spirit saw Jesus, threw the boy on the ground. All these things happened. Jesus asked the boy, how long has he been like this from childhood? And he talks about all these things. And then Jesus rebukes the Spirit, and he's out. Book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6 says this, Without faith it is impossible to please him. That's God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he, God, exists and that he, God, rewards those who seek him. If we are to draw near to God, we must believe that God is real in the person of Jesus Christ, that he exists, and we must believe that he rewards us for being faithful and obedient to him. That's what it means to be a believer. We can never advance beyond our need for faith. Faith is the essence of what we need to be doing. And how much belief, how much faith do we need? Often I get this question, how much faith do I need, Pastor? My friend has cancer. 
My friend has this. This family is in destitution. They're losing their house. How much faith do I need to have in our prayer? What does it take? I'm going to answer it for you. So you might as well write this down. In the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus tells us it is like the grain of a mustard seed. If you just have simple, small faith, Jesus says in the parallel passage of this, Matthew 17, that you could say to this Matthew, mountain, the one that they were just on, that Jesus was transfigured, get up and move and be into the sea and it would be done. But the indication is you don't even have that much faith. But if you have just a little bit of faith, God can do great things. The key is not the depth of our faith, but the direction of our faith. Write that down. The key is not the depth of our faith, but the direction of our faith. And the direction has to be what? Towards Jesus. That's what matters. Not how deep your faith is, but that you're moving in faith towards Jesus Christ. The key is not the power of your faith, but the person that your faith is in. The key is not the power of your faith or the depth of your faith, but the direction and the person of Jesus Christ that you have your faith in. See, it's not about what you say. It's not about a formula. It's not about a technique. That's nonsense. That is not taught in the scriptures. Anywhere at any time. It's about you believing strongly in your heart in Jesus Christ and what he can do. A little faith in a great Savior gets amazing results, right? Amen? A little bit of faith in an almighty Savior can get great results. The key is direction. Bring the boy to who? To me, Jesus said in verse 19. It's an imperative, a command. A time for messing around has come to its end, and Jesus says, I'm going to get this done if you'll send him in what direction? Towards me. See in Jesus, verse 20, the Spirit immediately, right? Immediately convulsed the boy, it says in the NASB. He fell to the ground, he rolled uncontrollably, and was foaming at the mouth. Jesus learns in verse 21 that it's gone on since childhood. And then in verse 22, the father, on many occasions, he has seen where it's almost been fatal for the child. And out of sheer desperation, he now turns to the only possible source, which is Jesus Christ, for his hope and his help. And he begs, if you can... If you can. I think that's interesting because Jesus turns around and says, if you can? Like, really? Do you know who you're talking to? You guys have ever seen Bruce Almighty, right? Come on, it's kind of fun. Bruce Almighty. Forget about the irreverence. We're going to try to look over that. But he walks around with all his piety. You know, I'm Bruce, and he wants this, and he wants that, and he just does it, right? Because God can do anything. He's almighty. And this guy is saying, if you can, Lord. And Jesus is saying, really? In the modern vernacular, really? Come on. If I can do this, I can do this. This is easy. The, fan, the man's faith is weak and small. But what does he say? He ends up saying that I do believe. But he also qualifies that. My faith is small. He says, Help me overcome my unbelief at the backside of verse 24. Help me in my unbelief. How many of you have been there where your faith in Jesus is there, but you're just not sure if he's big enough for the task? It's tough. And if you think standing on this side is just easy, it's not. I one time was called down to the hospital in Carl Springs, and one of the guys in my Bible study class, a young man in his late 20s, he had a boy and a girl. His boy was led to Christ, and I baptized him. His girl was two years old. She was precious. And she had an incurable disease that could kill her. And I had walked through these many, many last two years, many months with them, as he had to daily give these treatments, these shots, these needles to his little two-year-old. And he struggled with God. He was a man of faith. He was a good man. He was a good father. He was a good provider. He was a good husband. But he struggled in his faith. God, you can heal my daughter, but for whatever reason you don't, and I have to put her through this pain every single day, and she shrieks and she cries, and she begs me not to do it, but I have to do it to keep her life. And on this particular day, I got called down to the hospital because on top of that, he would backed over her, leaving for work that morning. So you walk into that ER 
OR waiting area. And I literally say as a man of God, God, I have no clue what I'm going to say to this man. I have no clue. I got nothing. Nothing but you. So you better show up, Lord. I'm asking you. Because I don't know how to help this, this couple that's in absolute pain. And I literally beg, God, don't let her die. Do not let her die. I begged God, don't let her die as I'm walking through the doors. He collapses in my arms. He cries. It was a tough eight hours. As she was in surgery to repair her broken pelvis, her shattered leg. The good news is she's running around as an eight-year-old now, living it up. See, I took the tension off you. I'm helping you out. <laughs> but the tension wasn't taken off for eight hours there. And I, he said, Greg, I don't understand. I love Jesus. I try to obey him. I just want to do what he wants. How can this happen? And I said, you know the answer to that as well as I do. And he goes, I know. This is a, well, he said some words, a crappy world. Put it another way. And I said, yeah. I said, but all I'm asking you to do is to hold on to Jesus today. How about you hold on to Jesus with me for the next hour? So we sat and we talked and we lightened things up and we waited for somebody to come out of the OR. And eventually that word came halfway through the surgery. She's touch and go. We're not sure if she's going to make it. We've repaired her, her hip but not her leg. But she's lost a lot of blood. And then he really got pretty shook and started to shake. And I said, just hold on. And I literally reached over and I grabbed his hand. And he tried to pull away, and I just held on to it. I thought, he's going to punch me in the teeth. <laughs> I did. I thought, he's going to club me. He's a pretty athletic guy. But instead, he kind of leaned into me, and he gripped me hard back. Another few hours went along, and then they came out and said, she's going to make it, but we're not sure how she's going to get through the night. So we're just going to take it piece by piece. Well, during that whole journey for the next week, until she stabilized and got strong, they only had one thing, but it was enough. And that was just to hold on to Jesus. They were hurting. They had very little faith. I remember him saying, God, I love you. Just help me in the areas that I don't. Help me with my unbelief. And God got him through. That's what our God does. We're never too big for Jesus, and we're never too big to rely upon faith. Faith in who? Faith in Him. Our faith can be weak, it can be small, but ultimately it needs to be on Jesus, right? The key is our, our dependency, our direction, and the person that we fall into, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, a few years later, she knows Jesus, and so does her, his son. They're involved in ministry, and he can say with you and I, Psalms 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because Jesus is all we need. We can take our refuge in and we can rely upon him. We know that in our honesty and our humility, we can say to him, we don't have enough belief, but it's enough if it's just a little bit moving towards Jesus. Ultimately, he has enough. Third thing is, I think in our ordinary Christianity, we become weak in our prayer. And so we need to learn that we never advance beyond our need for prayer. We never advance beyond our need for Jesus. We never advance beyond our need for faith. And we never advance beyond our need for prayer. I think sometimes prayer kind of gets pushed into the back corner. Isn't that true? It does in my own life sometimes. If I don't prioritize, if I don't discipline myself, it gets pushed into the back corner, right? And this is an interesting time for the disciples. They've learned a lot, right? Just compare these things. On the transfiguration up on the mountaintop, and with the healing of the boy, they're in the valley, Okay? In the transfiguration, the kingdom of God was on full display, the glory of God. And in the healing of the boy, the kingdom of Satan is in its full display. Up on the transfiguration on the mountaintop, they saw the Son of God in his radiant glory. And down with the healing of the boy, they saw a son that was terribly demonized. They went from the father who honored his son up on the mountain with the transfiguration to a father who was horrified for his son with a demon-filled boy. The disciples were confused and they lacked understanding up on the mountain. Remember the words of Peter? 
And down with the heel of the boy, they're not only confused, but they're defeated and they lack power. Up in the mountain with the transfiguration, they learned a, a lesson about the future that Jesus will be like this one day. But now down in the valley, they learn a lesson about their faith. And up on the mountain, they saw a display of divine power. But down in the valley, they're going to learn their absolute dependence upon God in prayer. Okay, in prayer. You got to think like these guys did. They must have thought, what went wrong? Back in chapter 3, binding the strong man, everything should have been fine. We should be able to cast out this demon. We should be fine. We should be able to do this. And it didn't happen. And why did Jesus say, after verse 28, Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it, the demon, out? In verse 29, Jesus replied, this kind, this can only happen through what? Through prayer. So in this passage about regular living of people, Jesus combines our need for him, our need for faith, with prayer life. Can we separate those things? If Jesus combines all those things in this passage, can we separate those things in our discipleship? No. We can't just be people of faith but think we can get away without prayer. We have to be people of serious prayer, right? And so the failure in our lives, kind of like Indiana Jones guys, the failure of picking the, the right cup should lead us to ask a couple of questions. Kind of once in a while, introspection is a good thing. And we should ask ourselves, are we being self-sufficient? Are we relying upon our own selves? So yeah, we put the name of Jesus on it. We put the label of Christian on it. But are we really bathing a big issue in our lives in prayer? And then when we're going to God in prayer, are we just kicking out words? Are we just punching the clock and doing time? Are we truly coming with a heart that is dependent upon the Father? You know, the disciples learned the hard way. Their failure was public. Remember the whipping they're getting from the teachers of the law? That's not a good way to do it, to fail publicly and to kind of get a whipping from your enemies. Luckily, God gives us our lessons a little bit more in private most of the time. They entered the house. Why could we not cast out this demon? The question betrays a sense of what? A confidence in their own strength. Because they say, why couldn't who? We cast him out. Jesus, we're the big dogs. We're your inner circle. We're your 12 disciples. We're the men. We got this. We did everything you've told us to do. How come we couldn't do that? And Jesus says, you have no dependency upon me. Because the dependent man is a prayerful man. Your dependency is demonstrated in your prayer life, right? Our failures in these areas should drive us to God in humility and push us to our knees. Our pride, our strength, our self-sufficiency, our power, all these things need to be cast aside in the things that we deal with in this world spiritually. And we need to throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Give me what I need. The way we begin our Christian walk at the foot of the cross is the same way we need to begin every single day. Is on our knees before the Father. Do you have any clue what's coming tomorrow? Do you have any clue? No. We went up to, my daughter was running a cross-country meet in uh, Ridgeway last week. So we went up on Friday. Big accident, overturned on US 50, a big tanker, like a gas tanker. Shut down it both ways for hours. Got through, watched it, can't go back that way. Ah, oh, we might go up on the mountain. Couldn't go up that way, why? Because the first fatality was on Red Mountain with that snow. That person entered that pass not thinking it was gonna be their last moment. Each and every one of our days is a little bit spiritually like being on ice, isn't it? Slippery at best. We end our days saying things are good and they are. God blesses and he does. And to some degree we kind of say we got this. And we have no clue what's coming on any given day in our lives. Tremendous blessings of God. The vast majority of our days. That we should turn around at the end of the day and thank him on our knees in prayer. And say thank you Jesus for providing for me. We were talking about that in Sunday school this morning all the tremendous blessings that we have and how we should thank God for that. But there's also those other days that are coming that we have no clue about the future that are going to test us and they're going to try us and they're going to put us through the fire. 
And if we're people of faith, even a little bit of faith, if we're people who depend upon Jesus and nothing else, if we're people of prayer, that that's a lifestyle and a habit, then we're going to weather through those days to the other side. But if we're not those kind of people, don't take it for granted that because you're a Christian, you're good to go. You're not. Many people hurt. Many people suffer. And believers are part of them. We live in a broken down, hurting world. So Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without what? Ceasing. When I was an early believer, I thought, okay, how do I do that? Pray, Lord Jesus. It doesn't mean you do that all the time, but it does mean as a regular pattern, like you breathe throughout the day, you should be breathing prayer throughout the day. And when you get on the roads, <laughs> 50 out here, or I-70, or Monarch, man, you better jump on the prayer train quick, right? It's crazy. Some of the jobs that you're part of, very dangerous jobs. I have no clue what it's like to be a miner. I admire miners. I, admire, I can't imagine how, it's, how you breathe polluted air, work a few miles underground with thousands of tons of rock, tens of thousands of millions of tons of rock on top of you, digging it out knowing that you're weakening the very structure that's holding it up. <laughs> and you're doing that because you love your family and you want to be a good provider and a good husband and a good father. That's amazing to me. They just amaze me. But I can't imagine ever entering that hole without talking to God a lot first. <laughs> I just can't imagine that. When I was a roofer, I didn't get up on a roof. I took my first fall eight days into my job. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to get impaled on rebar on this pool that was not poured yet. Man, I became a prayer warrior quick. Quick. That entire two summers, I'm praying, Lord, yeah, don't let me step on the hose. I'll break my nose. Don't let me do it. There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus responds to that sense of the dependency upon him and who he is. Pray without ceasing. Be anxious for nothing, right? It says in Philippians 4, but through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall do what? Shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That is a promise for God. Claim it. Live it. Rely upon faith and in prayer upon Jesus for it and see what happens. It's a powerful thing. Ephesians 6.16 says this in closing. The shield of faith is the one that can extinguish all the flaming arrows of who? The evil one. I talked about the full armor of God. Ordinary Christians go through life a lot of times thinking, we're good. I got this. Sometimes the things that you've done a million times in safety, you just go through without thinking about, not knowing that this is the time that something's going to go sideways. That's life on this plane. We're never too big to advance beyond Jesus. We're never too big to advance beyond our faith, even if it's a little faith. Be working to develop your faith. Test your faith. Trust God, pray to God, rely upon God, see God, see it through, and build your faith. The disciples after the cross who went to their death have a lot more faith than they do here, right? They failed here. But later on, they're casting out demons, they're healing people, they're doing things in God's names, they preach before the great people, and they go to their deaths for Jesus Christ because their faith grew immeasurably. And that's how our lives should be too. We are ordinary Christians just like these men. Fishermen, Tax collectors, business people, real people like you and I, flesh and blood. They grew in their faith, we can too. And the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, right? That's what we need to develop in our lives. God cares deeply for you. And he cares deeply for me. He cares about all the details of your life. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, I care about the, the bird that falls off that branch and hits the ground. I knew about it, and I care about it. I care about the blades of grass and the hairs on your head. And if you're like me, very few of those. But God still knows them and numbers them and cares about them, right? He cares about the small things and the big things in your life. And he asks you to bring yourself to him on your knees 
in prayer with what faith you have to offer. And we need to be just like the man. Father, help me with my lack of faith. I believe, but where I don't, fill me up. Fill my cup with your belief. Do you believe Jesus can give you faith? Yes. He gives faith all the time. That's how you come into the kingdom of God. That's how you stay in the kingdom of God. That's how you get through each and every day. It's by Jesus giving you the faith that you need. Ask him. See what he'll do. Let's pray.